Okay, let's start today with the Fukushima nuclear accident. Um, not because it's economics or because it's especially important in the grand scheme of things, um, but simply because it does seem for some reasons to be extremely interesting to us. It is the important thing are that between 10 and 50,000 people in Japan are dead of the earthquake and the following tsunami and that perhaps 500,000 people in Japan are now homeless um, and there are remarkable difficulties in getting food and warmth to them um, given the destruction of the transport network um, and that the environmental damage from you know, the interaction of the tsunami and industrial civilization is quite high. Um, compared to that, what's now going on in Fukushima is somewhere between a thousandth and a tenth of a Chernobyl back in 1986. And as best as we can figure out, Chernobyl poisoned a relatively small part of the marshy regions of Ukraine and caused about 50,000 excess cancers, extra cancers, in the human population of Europe. Um, might have been as low as 5,000, probably not. Might have been as high as 500,000, probably not. But 50,000 excess cancers for a Chernobyl uh, were facing, looks like, a hundredth of that in terms of total damage. Um, not yet something even a even within several orders of magnitude as important or as devastating as the simple earthquake and tsunami damage that we already saw. Um, however, it is interesting, um, it is in the news, uh, the big piece of knowledge we learn from it is that don't plan on the rest of your systems still being there if something happens to your nuclear power plant. This kind of nuclear fission power plant, um, the six reactor cores at Fukushima, they work by taking extremely high atomic number elements, um, atomic mass elements, um, things that are formed only in the cores of stars going supernova. Things formed only in the cores of stars going supernova at that very instant when the iron core of the star undergoes collapse immediately before the big explosion and a huge amount of energy is devoted into creating elements that are usually not found in nature. Those with a total number of protons between 200 and above, well above 200 um, in their nucleus. And normally you don't just see that. Normally whenever you start getting more than 50 protons and neutrons together in an atomic nucleus, the thing requires a lot more energy to make. Um, and by the time you've got up to 200, you have an enormous amount of energy in each of those atomic nuclei, to these atomic uranium nuclei. And so we split them apart with neutrons. And when we split them apart with neutrons, it releases an amazing amount of heat. And the heat we then use to drive pumps and boilers and turbines to create electricity. Um, when the earthquake hit, all of the reactors properly shut down immediately as they were supposed to do. The nuclear chain reaction of uranium fission um, was brought to a stop within seconds. The problem is that once you break a uranium nucleus up into two parts, each of those parts probably has around 100 protons and neutrons in its nucleus and is still probably not terribly stable. The one we're going to be worrying about is iodine-131 a little bit later on. But you have all these decay products in the fuel, and they then naturally break apart and release more energy, <coughs> which means that when you have a shutdown nuclear reactor, you still need to cool it, which means you still need to be pumping water through it in order to take the heat off of the core and then dissipate the water somewhere. And if you don't do that, the thing will melt down into a giant radioactive puddle on the floor of your reactor and as it melts down emit all kinds of nasty gases, a bunch of which will be quite radioactive um, as they head off into the upper atmosphere. So the important thing is when your reactor shuts down, make sure your pumps are still working and make sure your pumps are still pumping water um, to keep the reactor core cool. What happened was that the tsunami took out the power grid connecting the power plants, 
um, to the general Japan electric power, electric power supply and also took out the diesel generators that were supposed to serve as a backup power source if something happens to the connection to the general power grid. That the batteries, the second backup, ran for eight hours, which hasn't, wasn't enough to get new um, electrical generators to the pumps, to the plant, and operating, it turned out. Um, and so the cooling water began to boil away as it was no longer being pumped around the reactor core. And so by the time they got their new pumps up and ready to run, um, a whole bunch of the water had boiled away and the inside of the reactor vessels were extremely, extremely hot, which means you pump more seawater in. The seawater reacts to zinc in the reactor core and produces hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas builds up at a high pressure inside the containment, inside the building. Um, and if you have hydrogen gas at a high pressure and a high temperature and you get a spark, it goes boom. So that for the past four days, the engineers have been trying to pump enough seawater into the reactors in order to keep them cool so the fuel doesn't melt without pumping in so much seawater that they create so much hydrogen that the reactor building then explodes from a hydrogen gas explosion. Um, and they appear to have failed. Um, that is, we're going to have an atomic meltdown, and one result is going to be that there is going to be a cloud of radioactive stuff um, floating over Japan and out of the Pacific um, of some magnitude. Now, in general, this is not in itself an enormous worry. This is maybe a doubling or a tripling or a quadrupling of normal background radiation that even right smack at the power plant right now, um, right at its main gate, um, you have a radioactive flux of 500 microsieverts per hour. Um, the thing to compare this to is 5 million. You get 5 million microsieverts in an hour, and there's a 50% chance that you're dead. Um, you'd have to hang out at the reactor main gate for 10,000 hours um, at its current. Um, that's for about 14 months at the current radiation flux to receive a dose that is lethal for one dose, and that probably wouldn't be immediately lethal because your body would be using its repair systems to deal with such a low-level radioactive flux. The danger is that one of the radioactive decay products is likely to be a radioactive iodine, um, and iodine likes to get into your thyroid. And if radioactive iodine is sitting in your thyroid and occasionally emitting neutrons as it decays, that can give you thyroid cancer. Um, so, at the moment, the only significant health threat to anyone in Japan um, is that we may get a bunch more thyroid cancer cases um, over the next 15 years, unless, of course, something else goes wrong um, and the reactors don't kind of cool and puddle and melt and then gradually cool off. Um, they will cool off. right? And in general, the heavy decay products don't travel very far. Um, the long-lived decay products aren't very radioactive. And the decay products that are radioactive that you have to worry about, they decay very rapidly, and so pretty soon are no longer terribly radioactive. That's what's going on. That's what's going on at the other side of the Pacific uh, right now. And so now let's switch gears um, and let's go from nuclear physics to economics. Um, let's go to the last depression economics lecture, the one I'd hope to give before the midterm, um, on wrong theories um, of the Great Recession. <coughs> but first, I'd like to know how the midterm was um, that you took last Thursday while I was fulfilling my obligations to inform the political class of Ottawa, Canada. Um, of what their macroeconomic policy options are right now. Um, was the midterm too short and too easy? Um, too short and too hard? Um, too long and too easy? Um, or too long and too hard? Um, and people have definite views. Um, most people have definite views. 
Okay. Um, too long and too hard. Okay. All right, we'll take that into account for the next one. Um, of course, I would prefer that people say that it's just right. Um, it didn't seem to me to be too long and too hard. Um, but then I've been 30 years in this business. Office hours to talk about the midterm or other things of the future are today after class in the Free Speech Movement Cafe and tomorrow from 2 to 4 in Evans 601. And to encourage people to come to Evans and actually climb up the 60 vertical feet that then connects us with Evans and then to climb the additional 60 vertical feet up to my office, that or wait for the abysmally slow and underpowered elevators of Evans if you come at 3 will sneak you a cookie from the grad stu graduate student's cookie supply. Um, something else I learned last week um, is that I'm mostly in the economics department, um, which means that I tend to follow in grading what other economics professors told me the standard Berkeley curve was when I arrived back in 1995, which was that the median grade in a course should be about a B minus. And now I discover that in econ, over the past some year, the average grade has been not a B minus, but actually a slightly above average B, a 3.04. Uh, and furthermore, that econ is an outlier um, among social scientists. Whether you're talking about Haas, with its average grade of 3.37, um, psychology, with its average grade of 3.35, political science at 3.29, um, history at 3.31. Econ is way low by a full step, um, and I've been low relative to econ um, by a step. Um, so even though the purpose of putting out these statistics, even though they're limited form, was that the deans are trying to get a handle on grade inflation in Berkeley, the first implication of this is going to be the exact opposite. Um, I said at the start that the median grade in this course would be a B minus or a B, a low B, if you people worked hard and did extremely well, and I, Darius and I were really impressed. Um, the median grade in this course is going to be a B. Uh, and if you work hard and get I'm impressed and Darius and I are impressed, it'll be a low B plus. Um, that is, we're not going to punish you for the fact that I've had a false idea of what the average Berkeley social science curve was for the past 15 years. Um, but I do want you to work hard, and I do want you to remember, um, I do want you to remember how to do the key calculations that we were trying to get you to do and reel up the first midterm. Those involving the income expenditure model. So let's see how good you are at calculating real GDPY uh, under these circumstances. Or did you wipe it completely from your brains when the first midterm was over? Which is, I agree, a temptation. Um, Yep, the answer I'm looking for is C, is going to be 12 trillion. Um, you know, the idea is you have 8 trillion in the flows of autonomous spending at the top, and you take a tax rate of 25%, a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8. Uh, 0.75 times 0.8 is 0.6. 1 minus 0.6 is 0.4. Um, oops, oop, yeah, plus 0.267 is 0.667. That gives you a multiplier of 1.5. And 8 times 1 and a half should give you 12 trillion. Um, and similarly, for the investment savings version, um, for the investment savings version of the income expenditure model, this thing that divides, that's kind of uniquely good for figuring out how changes in economic policy are likely to affect the level of real output. Um, first question is what's the multiplier right, under these situations? Um, what's the denominator here and what's its inverse? You know. 
And the hope is that, yes, you can calculate a multiplier of 2. Um, which is what I was looking for. Um, and then once you have this multiplier of 2, um, once you have this multiplier of 2, suppose that the Federal Reserve and financial markets together raise the long-term real risky interest rate by 3%. Uh, what's going to happen? Um, what's going to happen to Y? Um, you know, nothing's happening to consumer confidence or to foreign exchange speculators. Nothing's happening to government fiscal policy. Um, we're just having something happen to the long-term risky real interest rate, which is then going to hit the exchange rate, and the interest rate and the exchange rate are then going to hit investment spending and ex gross exports. And those, together with the multiplier, are going to give you its net effect on real GDP. Okay, and D fall by 1.8%. Um, yep, that's what we're looking for. Um, that's the right way to do problems like these. Um, so with that as prologue, um, let me briefly review the right model of the Great Recession. Um, the model I've been pushing in the fa past several weeks of the course since we stopped the economic growth section. Um, and the right model of the Great Recession is that we had three sources of our downturn. We had irrational exuberance in housing markets that led to a whole bunch of mortgage loans being made that should not have been made. And that wouldn't have been a problem if you'd had, or wouldn't have been a major problem, if you'd had a capital market arrangement like we had in the late 1990s for the dot-com bubble, where there also was irrational exuberance, much more irrational exuberance, in fact, than we saw in the um, subprime mortgage bubble. Um, but that irrational exuberance had not been accompanied by over-leverage, that the businesses, the venture capital firms that created the securities of the dot-com companies then sold them all off to their own primary investors, rather than holding on to them and borrowing money so they could buy even more of them. So when the dot-com crash came, a bunch of individuals lost a lot of their wealth, but it wasn't the case that a bunch of large money center banks went bankrupt. Um, here, however, the large money center banks that borrow and invest found that they were holding more subprime mortgages than they had capital. Um, that they were no longer good to pay back all the deposits to the people who deposited their money in the banks or to pay back all the loans from the money that the banks had borrowed, in large part because of misregulation, because the government had failed to require proper capital adequacy standards of all of these banks and had failed to use the hammer to make sure that they were exercising um, proper risk controls. The consequence was panic and a flight to quality. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of assets in the financial sector that you thought were safe places to put your money, that you could park your money into mortgage-backed securities, go away, and when you came back, your money would still be there. Um, all of a sudden, it becomes clear that the supply of high-quality assets is a lot lower than people thought, because a bunch of the things that were labeled AAA high-quality no longer are. And all of a sudden, it becomes clear that the ability of financial professionals to properly understand their risks has been greatly overstated, and that there's a lot more risk out there in the world than people had imagined. These two things, a decrease in the supply of safe assets and an increase in the perceived riskiness of the market as a whole, um, these both create an enormous imbalance between the supply of high-quality financial assets in the world and the demand, um, and this large excess demand for high-quality assets, well, this produces a general glut, a shortage of demand for currently produced goods and services and labor as people respond to the fact that they are sh short of high-quality assets, they don't have the high-quality assets they want to hold, by cutting back on spending in order to build up their, their stocks of high-quality assets. 
<coughs> but when they and everyone else cuts back in spending, all they do is cut back on sales, on employment, on income. They find their cutback on spending is matched by a fall in their incomes, and they actually don't manage to save much more. But as total spending falls short of the amount needed to provide full employment, the economy heads into recession. And we've talked a lot about the right cure for the Great Recession. Um, and the right cure, we decided, had three parts. The first was regulatory reform, so that this won't happen again, or will be less likely to happen again. Um, repair the defects of regulation that allowed banks to get themselves into an absurd, this absurd position. Um, repair over leverage, right? that is, try to make sure that bankers notice that if they get over leveraged, they're then going to suffer, uh, both in their pocketbooks and in the survival of their institutions, if they make bad decisions that lead them to taking on excessive risk. Um, trying to curb irrational exuberance on the part of savers and investors, you know, that's a much harder task. We haven't advanced very far on that. Hopefully, regulatory reform and reform of or bank risk practices will do enough. That's the first uh, prong of the cure. Um, the second is while you're waiting for regulatory reforms to take effect, if they are going to take effect, you want to repair the shortage of aggregate demand. Um, and there are two ways to do that. You can have the government stand up via spending when pr private sector stands down. You can have expansionary fiscal policy. The government can purchase more stuff. Second, you can carry out strategic interventions in financial markets to provide the private sector with the financial assets that it wants. Um, and when the private sector has the financial assets that it wants, well then asset prices will go back to normal and you will no longer have this elevated long-term real risky interest rate, um, which is putting downward pressure on spending. Um, and you can intervene in financial markets through a bunch um, of mechanisms. Um, deficit spending by the government and encouraging private investment by businesses, it creates more savings vehicles, um, more places for people to park their money if they want to move it from the present into the future. And if that's your problem, as it was in 2001, those are appropriate things to do. The Federal Reserve can sell its, can um, buy back bonds from the private sector for cash and so increase the amount of liquid cash money in the economy. And if the problem is a shortage of liquid cash money, as it was in 1982, that's an appropriate thing to do. And the Federal Reserve and the bank regulators together can, by guaranteeing banks, by taking risk onto their own books, by a whole host of quantitative easing measures, they can repair the imbalance in the supply and demand for high quality assets which was our major problem in 2007 and 2008. Um, all hoping that when you manage to get financial markets back to comfort with the asset stocks that are there, when there is no excess demand at full employment for financial assets, there won't be any downward pressure on production um, and on employment. Um, that's the right cure for the Great Recession. And in the investment savings frame version of the income expenditure framework, uh, we can see that in our equation for the change in real GDP as a function of the change in other stuff, plus government's fiscal policy, stimulative government fiscal policy can boost GDP. And things that affect either the price of liquidity, this short-term safe nominal interest rate, or things that affect the spread between short-term nominal and long-term real interest rates, things that affect the price of, of high-quality assets in the economy that affect their supply and demand balance, can also move exports and investment spending, and so move the level of real GDP. Um, and that's what we ought to have done on a larger scale than we did in 2008 and 2009. Um, that the root problem was a derangement in the um, subprime mortgage market, which then triggered a derangement in financial markets more generally due to overleverage and misregulation. But you don't have to fix that to avoid mass unemployment. You just have to figure out a way to get aggregate demand back to where it should be and then clean up the financial mess later on. Um, 
you know, that job number one is to prevent unemployment from going up, um, rather than to fix the fundamentals of the financial system. Um, that's what we should have done. Um, and as he said before, we could do this, have done this through a bunch of tools. Through expansionary fiscal policy, which we did some of, but on a larger scale than we did. Through the central bank engaging in standard open market operations to drop the short-term um, short safe nominal interest rate, um, which it did do a great deal. Um, to try to increase the supply of savings vehicles by getting businesses to invest more, by making them think inflation will be a little bit higher, by having the government print up more bonds and then send the, pro send the proceeds in order to increase the stock of savings vehicles that people want to hold, and to convince people that the Federal Reserve will keep interest rates low for a long time to come, and also that to take risk onto its own book and to diminish the risk spread, all in attempts to boost the prices of long-term real risky assets and push down the long-term real risky interest rate um, as a way of rebalancing financial markets. Um, that's the right theory. Um, of the Great Recession. But you go out there into the great political economic debate, um, into the scrimmage, and you find that the position I've been pushing in this course, um, while it's the dominant position and it's the plurality position, and it's the position held by most experts, um, is by no means the only position um, that are out, that's out there. Um, that in addition to people saying our problem is that misregulation, excess of leverage, and irrational exuberance produced a financial crisis, which then led to an aggregate demand shortfall that we should repair, um, you find at least seven other positions out there. Um, four of them say, no, 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 that's not the origin of our current macroeconomic difficulties at all. It springs from something else. And then three of them say, well, maybe that was the origin, but all of these stimulative policies that you want to pursue, they really are unwise. Um, that keeping interest rates low is not a good thing to do. Um, that the European Central Bank should take steps right now to reduce the supply of money in the European economy and raise interest rates um, back up as in fact the London Economist is conducting an internet debate among economists right now um, on that does the European Central Bank, should the European Central Bank raise interest rates um, right now. Um, and so that puts me in a dilemma. Um, there are seven other factions and schools of economists out there saying other and different things, um, you know, different from me. And I firmly believe that I'm right, um, really firmly believe that I'm right, um, um, almost as solidly as I believe that you know, the um, sun will rise in the east tomorrow. Um, of course, there was the time I was flying over the North Pole on the way back from Europe in northern hemisphere winter. And we thus we came into the sun out of the Earth's shadow, just when we were flying south over Manitoba and as the, someplace north of Manitoba, and as a result, that day the sun rose in front of us directly in the south. Um, it's not certain the sun's always going to rise in the east. In fact, I've seen it do otherwise. Admittedly, only in very special circumstances of being thirty thousand feet up and flying due south out of the um, Earth's shadow during Northern Hemisphere winter. Um, but, you know, if ever someone says that the sun's certain to rise in the east tomorrow, um, remember that because it's empirical proof of David Hume's argument that induction, that just because something's happened a thousand times doesn't mean it'll happen the same way the next time, that David Hume's skepticism about induction um, is well founded. Um, so, Given that I'm certain I'm right, um, it's my task to explain to you um, why I'm certain I'm right. Um, and then also, even if I do convince you of, that I'm right, I have to explain why are all these other people wrong. Um, they're not dumb. They're making a study of the situation just as I am. Um, why are they thinking differently 
And also, if you run across someone who's following them who thinks differently, what are the arguments that you can quickly deploy um, to convince them that they're wrong and that you um, or I am right? Um, and so I suppose I should start um, with the end, with the question of why are so many people holding on to these wrong models? And here I blame Milton Friedman. Um, you know, former professor, the late Milton Friedman, professor, longtime professor at the University of Chicago, head of the Chicago School of Economics. Um, then he developed some sense and moved to the Bay Area, um, got a post as a teacher at Stanford, m lived in North Beach, um, kind of in a nice tower with a good view of the ocean. Um, I'd go down and have coffee with him occasionally, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I blame Milton Friedman because he made things much, much too simple. Um, that his idea was you should simply stabilize the money stock via open market operations and keep the economy's money stock growing smoothly, and then everything will be fine. There'll then be no shortage of aggregate demand, and you don't need to worry about this income expenditure framework or these Keynesians or this fiscal policy or this banking policy stuff. Um, that all you have to do is stabilize the money stock and the world will be fine. Um, now, why did Friedman think this? Um, well, I think there are two big reasons. The first was that if you look back from, say, 1980 or so, back into the past, um, it is the case that times when the money stock is unstable are times when there are depressions, and times when the money stock is stable are times when there are no depressions. Although you could argue over whether instability in the money stock was cause or effect. Um, Milton Friedman thought that instability in the money stock was a cause of the depressions. Bunches of other people thought it was the effect. Um, they argued back and forth. What I think made Friedman certain that instability of the money stock was the cause was the fact that he was in general a committed libertarian. You know, and not just an economic libertarian, not just a believer that the government shouldn't be interfering in the marketplace in prices and quantities, uh, but also a social libertarian, uh, a believer that the government shouldn't be sticking its nose into people's bedrooms or into their drug-taking habits uh, or into their ideas to pursue better living through chemistry or whatever. Um, and if you do that, well, then you have a certain conceptual problem if you're a macroeconomist. You want to say that that government is best that governs least. Um, you know, establish property rights, set up some courts to decide things if people dispute. Otherwise, just get out of the way. Um, but if you have this complicated macroeconomic income expenditure system by which the government is always having to intervene to rebalance financial markets to avoid mass unemployment, um, that doesn't fit with your picture of the way that the world works. And so you say, that's got to be wrong. Let me look for a simpler framework, um, a simpler framework that would allow me to understand um, why it is that sometimes the government's interventions in the economy look like they've actually been good. Um, and what he arrived at was the empirical finding that whenever the government had intervened in such a way as to keep the money stock stable, well, then things looked pretty good. And he generalized to this to his constant money stock growth rule. Um, say, only if the money stock grows smoothly will things do well, and all the other stuff, all the other bells and whistles is unnecessary. Um, now, this isn't a terribly, terribly comfortable position for a libertarian to be in, uh, because you do have the government intervening in the money market constantly, buying and selling bonds for cash all the time to offset whatever changes in the supply of money are generated by private agents' transactions. Um, but Friedman thought it's good, it's simple, it's a bright line rule, it's easy for the government to do. Um, let's say you do that and you can ignore all this other Keynesian stuff. Um, and so Milton Friedman acquired a lot of followers behind his constant money stock growth rule in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and then starting in the 1990s, it becomes apparent that it's simply not true. Um, we have lots of central banks that follow Milton Friedman-esque um, prescriptions right, that try to say we're just going to keep the money stock growing constantly in the economy and that will avoid big depressions. 
um, and you have big depressions. Um, and so then what do you do when you've been taught for 50 years that all of the Keynesian, Vixellian, Fisherian macroeconomics is wrong, all you need to do is follow a constant money stock growth rule. And then lo and behold, it turns out that following a constant money stock growth rule doesn't help you in late 2008, that the unemployment rate heads up to 10%. Um, and at this point, you can do two things. Um, one, you can say, oops, um, we've been followers of Milton Friedman for 50 years and we were wrong. <coughs> Um, his intellectual opponents were right. Um, we have to go back and listen to them and learn what they had to say and change our minds. Um, and the other thing to say is, well, we know that the kind of alternative income expenditure approach was wrong. Milton Friedman taught us so. Um, if there's something wrong with his theory, there must be something we haven't considered. Um, we have to add something else to Milton Friedman's model. Something else is going wrong. Let's run out and see what it is. And it turned out an awful lot of economists decided to follow the second road, um, that rather abandon monetarism for its competitor, for its more demand-oriented income expenditure competitor. They began running around and acting like the successors of Ptolemy, um, saying, gee, the normal um, terracentric model um, doesn't properly describe the motion of the planets in the sky, but maybe I can add an extra epicycle, an extra equant, um, an extra um, an extra deferral, deference, in order to make the model work. Um, and so you have a lot of economists finding themselves trying to think complicated issues through on the fly from scratch even though there's a perfectly good theory of why we're undergoing a recession, a theory that back, dates back to 1829, and John Stuart Mill and Jean-Baptiste Say, at least in its original form, waiting there for them. Um, so let me run through what these schools are um, and why people believe in them and why they shouldn't. Um, the first, um, and this Niall Ferguson of Harvard is a big booster for it, um, Tyler Cohen at George Mason is a pretty big booster of it, is the idea that we have high unemployment now because our educational system has failed. And we in America have produced 12 million workers who effectively have no skills, right? That they aren't even, don't even have the skill or perhaps the mental discipline to stand behind the cash register and make change and keep people from shoplifting at the 7-Eleven. Um, that they're too bored or too inattentive or whatever. Um, and so we can't find a job for these 12 million people to do at which they have a positive marginal product or perhaps at which they're worth more than the minimum wage. Uh, people following this line say maybe we should shrink the minimum wage. Um, and the comparison, um, the comparison is between say, the coming of computers and the full decline in manufacturing and agriculture on the one hand in the labor force and the coming of the horseless carriage um, on the other. That is, back in the late 19th century, America had kind of one horse per person. Right? Horses were extremely useful. You can ride them. They can pull things. You can put them on a treadmill and make them walk on the treadmill and it can drive you know, some grindstone of one sort or another. So we had an awful lot of horses. Then we developed alternative technologies. Steam power, diesel engines, gasoline engines, electricity. And all of a sudden, the marginal product of nearly every single horse who had existed um, was zero. Um, horses are now useful only for entertainment, for exercise and for crowd control and intimidation. When the police really want a crowd to see that they're not just facing a human being, even a human being with a gun, but they're facing a really large animal with really heavy feet and very sharp hooves that could kick really, really hard. Um, most of the horses we had in the late 19th century bring them back and they would have zero marginal product in our economy. Um, why, Neil and Tyler ask, can't we conclude that the same isn't true of the 12 million excess American workers who are now unemployed? Um, the big question, though, is that um, 
They're unemployed now. Um, they all became unemployed in 2008 and 2009. Um, since 2009, the unemployment hasn't been growing fast enough to diminish this number. But they weren't unemployed back in 2007. Um, if it really is the case that we have 12 million workers who have not been properly educated and socialized and so have a zero marginal product because we can't find anything for them to do, uh, why were they all employed back in 2006 and 2007? Um, the answer to that, um, the answer to that is that, well, back in 2007, we employed them all building houses because we thought houses were very valuable things, and so we needed a lot more of them. Now we discover that, no, houses aren't terribly valuable things, especially if they're in the desert between Los Angeles and Albuquerque. Um, we really don't need them. And thus, now that our 12 million workers are no longer pounding nails in Nevada, there's nothing that anyone is willing to pay them for because we used to think they had a high marginal product working in construction. Now we know that they don't. The only job at which they might possibly have been able to earn their keep was construction. We've recognized they can't. That's why this 12 million oversupply of excess workers has emerged relatively quickly. Um, problem with that um, is that employment in construction has only fallen by 2 million, uh, according to payroll reports from the U.S. Department of Labor. And of this decline in 2 million, um, perhaps 500,000 are people who have gone back to Mexico, who were immigrants from Mexico, whether legal ones or illegal ones who are using someone else's social security number when they got reported to the statistical system. Um, meaning that of those, of the 12 million unemplo excess unemployed currently here in the United States, um, something like 1 point, only 1.5 million can be attributed to the decline in construction unemployment. Employment. Where do the other 10.5 million come from? Um, why is it that even if we do have one and a half million structurally unemployed, zero marginal product workers created by the decline in the construction sector, why is it that that's carried an extra ten and a half million um, employed along with it? Don't the other ten and a half million have skills? They seem to have perfectly good skills doing whatever they were doing back in 2006 and 2007. Um, why is it that each for each one construction job that vanishes. We have eight or seven other jobs vanishing in the economy as a whole. Um, that seems to me to be a decisive argument against the idea that we now have a high, high unemployment because we've recognized that we have a bunch of workers who have essentially nothing they can do that's worth doing. Um, that's the first. The second and related view is that it's not that there's nothing they can do. <coughs> it's not that we have 12 million workers who don't have the skills and the mental attitude and the willingness to show up to make it worth anyone's while to pay them to do anything, uh, but that rather we do have a bunch of workers whose skills are in the wrong jobs. That we have a large number of unemployed workers and they don't have the skills to get the jobs in the industries that are currently expanding. And so we need to retrain them. And retraining workers it takes a lot of time because you have to shift them out of the job they used to do into the jobs that are now potentially highly productive. Um, and the question you ask of people, um, primarily, I suppose, Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Nariana Kocher Lakota, who are big pushers of this structural unemployment theory, is if there are expanding industries that are having a hard time finding workers, we should be able to see them. We should see a lot of vacancies in the economy. As there are a bunch of expanding industries that want to hire workers but can't find any qualified workers to hire, because the people fired from the shrinking sectors do not have not yet been retrained. And we should see a bunch of wage increases, even if not in the economy as a whole, although we should see it in an economy as a whole as the trained and skilled workers get bit away from their other jobs. We should be seeing a bunch of wage increases 
at least in the expanding industries that are short of labor because they can't find qualified workers. You know, and where are they? Um, job openings. Um, job openings are a good 600,000 above their absolute minimum mid-2009 trough, but job openings are still way, way below their normal non-recession level. You can't look at this job openings graph and say that we have an economy with a greater than usual number of job openings in it because the workers we have aren't properly equipped to take the jobs that are open in expanding industries. Um, you can't say that there's a lot of upward pressure on people's wages. When back four years ago, your average wage increased by 4% in dollars in a year, by 2% in real terms, and now average wage increases are kissing zero um, in real terms. Right? The world that the structural unemployment people see is a world in which there are a lot of vacancies in America today and in which there's a lot of upward pressure on wages as businesses that see market opportunities but can't find workers offer to pay more um, and to pay more at an accelerated way, right, to get more workers into um, their particular firms. We're just not seeing that either. Um, over accumulation of capital. Um, this is the oldest alternative theory of all. Um, this it was a favorite of Chicago economist Friedrich Hayek. Um, it was the theory on which Andrew Mellon and Herbert Hoover ran the U.S. economy at the start of the Great Depression. It actually dates all the way back to Karl Marx, um, who talked about how economists like James John Stuart Mill and the politicians they advised, like Robert Peel, think that you can deal with a financial crisis and a depression um, by this simple game of monetary policy, you know, by a form of financial three-card Monty by which the central bank, um, say, cr increases the liquidity so the high-quality assets stock in the economy. Um, and no, you can't, said Marx, because even though the appearance of the crisis is that it starts in the financial sector, it's actually a real crisis and it's a real crisis produced by the fact that use values are separated from exchange values and that the fetishism of commodities means that the investment process is guaranteed to run awry and produce much too much capital um, for a market economy to effectively use. Um, that is, a market economy can only run at full employment if the surplus value earned by, or the surplus value received by employers is then plowed back um, into investing to increase their capital stock. Um, but if the surplus value is then invested in increasing the capital stock, um, well then who are you going to sell the next round of increased production to? Uh, well, there has to be even more surplus value in the future. The workers aren't getting any higher incomes. And eventually the thing will come into a crash with a big valorization crisis when some manufacturers and some producers say, hey, wait a minute, um, the only, we've been um, buying to increase our factories because we think that there'll be more demand in the future. Where is the demand from consumers coming from? There is no more demand from consumers. We should stop investing. And then you have a big crash because you've overaccumulated capital, because you have too much capital in the economy to support demand um, at the then current level of productivity, distribution of income, and surplus value. Marx thought that the answer to this was the Nash socialization of private property, um, the elimination of the bourgeoisie as a class, and the creation of a free society of associated producers. Um, and this was the reason that Marx thought the capitalist system should be ended as quickly as possible. Okay. Mellon and Hayek and Hoover tended to say, well, this is a drawback to what otherwise is a pretty good system. Um, and when the crisis comes because of the overaccumulation of capital, you just got to suffer through it and accept that high unemployment for a while is a price that you've got to pay um, for all the good things the market produces. There have always seemed to me to be two um, big questions here. Right? Um, the first is Paul Krugman's question which is you follow the argument of the Marx, Mellon, Hayek, Hoover axis. Um, the big problem is that the economy has too much capital and too many people are working on making capital goods. 
and so they have to get unemployed, and when they get unemployed, they lose their jobs, and when they lose their jobs, the incomes fall, and you get a recession. But the root cause is there's too much capital. Um, and the people working in capital goods sectors have to lose their jobs. Krugman says it's okay, sometimes the economy gets too much capital, uh, but also there are times when the economy has too much consumption goods as well. Right? When there's not an overaccumulation of capital, but instead an overproduction of consumption goods, and people really go to the marketplace and they say, I really don't want to buy these extra, I don't know what, Ferraris, I want to save some money in the future. And then when there's too great a level, when there's an overproduction of consumption goods, um, well, then what happens is the people making consumption goods have to lose their jobs and go find jobs someplace else. Um, but whenever there's an overproduction of consumption goods, um, whenever there's too little savings in the economy um, relative to planned investment, um, you don't get a recession. Um, instead, you get a boom. Um, there's no period of high unemployment that follows the redeployment of workers from consumption goods to capital goods industries. There's only high unemployment that accompanies the switching of workers out of capital goods and into consumption goods industries. And Paul Krugman has always thought, and I've agreed, that this is a decisive argument against um, the overaccumulation of capital theory. Um, besides, what evidence is there um, for a current capital surplus? You look at private construction spending in the United States, say, since um, are we in the 80s, yeah, so since the early 1990s. And, you know, it's growing nicely and smoothly, and then we get the big housing bubble. And it is indeed true. We have this large orange triangle up here, which is the building of housing and other buildings over and above trend that we saw during the period of irrational exuberance and excessive leverage, and then the housing bubble crashed. Um, and then you get this large trapezoid, um, during which housing production is depressed below its trend level. And by now, no matter how you do the trend, this trapezoid here is bigger than this triangle. Uh, the housing market has spent more years depressed by more than it spent elevated back during the boom. We don't have a surplus of houses relative to trend. We have a shortage. Um, admittedly, we don't have the houses we would really want. What we'd really want to have would be a lot more two-bedroom condos in Venice Beach, where you can actually get somewhere in LA within a reasonable period of time, rather than a huge number of five-bedroom houses with swimming pools out somewhere beyond Riverside and San Bernardino. Uh, where it's not possible to get anywhere in less than four, you might want to be in less than four hours, unless you really like the desert. Um, but the fact that a bunch of our houses in the wrong, are in the wrong place, that that should mean that we'd be more eager to build houses um, and not less. The idea that we have an overaccumulation of capital um, is simply wrong. Um, what we have is we have a high housing vacancy rate because a lot of people have lost their jobs and so are doubling up in their apartments with their relatives. Um, not because we have, in any sense, built too many houses. Um, and so even at the empirical level, the overaccumulation of capital theory um, seems to me simply not to fly. Um, fourth, uh, we have the idea, and I don't know any, well, maybe John Taylor at Stanford. Um, who I think really wants a job in the next Republican administration um, too much. Um, maybe John Taylor at Stanford would back this one, but this is one you hear almost exclusively from politicians, which is that it's uncertainty, that there's been an enormous increase in uncertainty since the election of Obama. And because there's been this enormous increase in uncertainty uh, due to government deficits and overregulation, which makes businesses cut back on their spending, and we can't get spending up again until we do something to make businesses less uncertain about the future. Um, and here, um, you know, I'd say there are three questions that are decisive. Um, the first is if businesses are uncertain and are worried about overregulation and overtaxation, 
you know, shouldn't they be saying so? Here at the bottom, we have the National Federation of Independent Businesses percent of small businesses in its survey naming each issue as the single most important problem since 1986. The green stuff up above um, are taxes. Um, the proportion of businesses labeling saying that our ta high taxes um, are our most important problem. And it fluctuates between 20 and 30 percent. Um, rising, say, to high of 30 percent at the start of Clinton's second term, um, falling to 20 percent after Bush's number two tax cut, uh, doing a bizarre dip um, in early 2007. Um, I think because a bunch of the people answering the survey were watching Fox News and thought that somehow the fact that Nancy Pelosi was now Speaker of the House meant their taxes had gone up. Um, and that they must be suffering from higher taxes because there was this Democrat sitting in the speaker's chair um, and everyone knew she wanted to raise taxes even though she was unable to. Um, and over-regulation, um, government requirements, this as well. Insurance cost is this thing you really can't see. Um, because massive failure of projector technology. Um, insurance costs, health insurance costs were a very big deal around 2003 and 2004. Uh, but government requirements, um, no big change. The change you see are financial and interest rates are high and poor sales are high. That if you ask small businesses why is it that they are upset with the current economic situation, it's not because they're unusually worried about overregulation and overtaxation. It's because demand is low, aggregate demand is low, and because the interest rates at which they borrow um, are high. And if you have a theory of the Great Recession that attributes um, things happening in the minds of business proprietors, um, as to government policy as the cause of a recession. If you say that it's these worries about government policy that have hit the minds of business entrepreneurs and that's the cause of the recession, when you ask business entrepreneurs what are you worried about, they should be worried. Uh, if they're not worried, the argument simply doesn't go through. Um, similarly, if businesses are genuinely worried about inflation due to government deficits, um, shouldn't we see this in financial markets? It, shouldn't we see the price that you have to pay in financial markets for the trade which insures you against inflation over the next 10 years? Um, shouldn't that be, have a high price now? Instead of being a break-even trade at the about 2% per year expected inflation rate, which it's been a break-even trade for most of the past decade or so, with the exception of the depth of the financial crisis. That there's no sign that businesses worried about inflation are taking any steps to insure themselves against it. Um, and as to high interest rates in, gen in general, um, interest rates on safe U.S. Treasury securities continue um, at their extraordinarily low levels. So this too, uh, uncertainty simply fails to meet the plausibility test. Um, that if people were uncertain and if that were causing the recession, we would expect to see signs of uncertainty in financial markets and surveys. Um, we don't. It's entirely possible that uncertainty about future policy can generate a recession, um, but no signs it's generating this one. Similarly, it's entirely possible that overaccumulation of capital can generate a collapse of investment and a recession, but not this one, or if it did generate this one, it should have been over long ago. It's certainly possible that you can have a situation in which unemployment is high because of structural unemployment, because the workers you have aren't trained for the jobs that are profitable. But those are, again, situations in which there are high vacancies and rapidly rising wages, um, which is not now. Um, and low marginal product workers, um, well, you know, the horse example, um, that maybe if people become whore-like horses, 
Um, and then maybe you could say that changes in the economy might render a huge share of the potential labor force unemployable, just as the coming of electricity, the steam engine, and the internal combustion engine um, kind of rendered a great deal of the American horse population of the late 19th century unemployable as well. Um, but people aren't horses. Um, we don't have nearly as strong muscles as horses do. Uh, but each of us comes with one brain, one mouth, and two hands. And so we're much more flexible and adaptable um, than horses are. Um, and we also can respond to incentives. Um, you know, so the argument that you can't redeploy America's low marginal product workers to other occupations than pounding nails in Nevada because their low marginal product is too low to make it worth their while to employ them in any other industry. That seems to me to fail as well, um, given the adaptability of the human being, um, especially because there simply aren't enough people working in construction in 2007 who are still here and are not working in construction um, to account for more than a very small fraction of the rise in unemployment that we've seen. Um, then there are the three views that say we're not, we're going to be agnostic about the sources of the recession, but we definitely don't need stimulative policies right now. Um, the first, and this argument I hear most from John Cochran of the University of Chicago, is that further stimulative policies will set off a burst of inflation that will harm the economy in the long run and its cousin that further stimulative policies will raise interest rates and crowd out private investment um, and slow long-term government growth. On the internet this morning, once again, um, who was it? Somebody had a rant about how worries that Japan, Japanese reconstruction after the earthquake, um, about how that will push up interest rates and so diminish private investment and harm the global economy as the Japanese government borrows and spends a whole bunch of money um, to deal with the crisis caused by the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, a rant about how that just doesn't apply um, because what we saw in the aftermath of the tsunami and the earthquake was not an increase but a decrease in the interest rates on Japanese and American government bonds. That people are more willing to buy them Right, not less, that we're not crowding out private investment, um, we're crowding it in. Um, if there were a genuine need to control inflation, um, well, you'd expect to see wages increase, or you'd expect to see the inflation rate implicit in government bond prices, this red line rising rapidly, and no, it's, but you'd expect to see this blue line, um, which is the kind of real interest rate. Um, rising rapidly, and it's not, um, you know, that we see a situation in which an economy is approaching an inflation danger looks like, um, and once again it doesn't look like this. Um, and then we have those who say that banking and fiscal policy are simply unnecessary, um, who hang on to the old Milton Friedman Monetary policy is all that's necessary. Keep the stock of money growing smoothly and everything will be fine. Um, here we have Nobel Prize winner Robert Lucas of the University of Chicago trashing Berkeley's own Christina Romer um, rather unfairly, um, which annoys me um, and which makes me think I should put up this slide fairly often and point out that well, you look at what Robert Lucas said in the late March conference at the Council on Foreign Relations during his question and answer session. Um, and the first thing you recognize is that he hasn't really thought any of the issues through. That if you took Robert Lucas back to 1829 and put him in a room with John Stuart Mill and Jean Baptiste Say, um, and had Lucas give his argument for why it was that increased government purchases or that bank rescues wouldn't help an economy in a financial crisis. Um, you know, I think that both Mill and Say would say, and this is supposed to be in Macroeconomist, um, 
that these are issues that we have gotten straight now in 1829 about the relationship between the soundness of the banking sector and the level of overall employment. Um, how come Bob Lucas in 2009 right, has not? Um, or other ones. Um, say Eugene Fama of Chicago, often mentioned as a possible future Nobel Prize winner, um, saying on how fiscal policy has to be ineffective uh, because whenever the government spends, it has to borrow, and whenever it borrows, it has to take a money away from a single private individual um, who's also spending, and so whatever the government does to spend money has, by definition, got to decrease what the private sector spends on goods and services. You know, and that's simply wrong, right? Um, simply because when the private sector's income goes down, it doesn't have to cut its spending if it's willing to have, if it's willing to hold fewer financial assets um, instead. Um, and indeed, the whole reason that increased government spending is supposed to work is that it makes people more comfortable holding the financial assets that they have, and so makes them less anxious to cut back on their spending on currently produced goods and services in order to build up their stocks you know, of financial assets. Uh, Myron Scholes, a Stanford finance professor, a Nobel Prize winner, um, also criticizing Bernanke um, on the idea that for the Federal Reserve to buy bonds, risky bonds, and hold them in its portfolio for cash can't affect interest rates um, because the Federal Reserve buys bonds. Um, those bonds are then the property of the Federal Reserve. The risk is then borne by the Federal Reserve, but who bears the risk that the Federal Reserve will go bankrupt, rather that's the taxpayers. Um, the same risk existed now, it exists, it, that existed then, it can't have any effect on asset prices. Um, that seems to me to be simply wrong because taxpayers are a very different group of people than investors. Um, investors are rich and old, um, taxpayers are middle class and much younger. Um, shift a whole bunch of risk off of investors who are already bearing too much risk, um, much more risk than they want to, as shown by the high risky real interest rates in the economy, shift it onto taxpayers. It's quite, quite plausible um, that that will change the risk premium. Um, and indeed, economists at the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco and elsewhere who have been estimating the effects of the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing programs have been finding that it's been reducing interest rates by on the order of half a percentage point or so. Um, and yet, all seven of these lines of argument um, seem to me to be absolutely, completely, and obviously fallacious. Right? There are simply not enough unemployed construction workers to account for the recession. Um, there's no sign of the high vacancies you have in a high structural unemployment economy. Um, the overaccumulation of capital simply doesn't work once you look at this graph and see that the overbuilding triangle is less than the post-crisis um, depressed underbuilding trapezoid. Um, for uncertainty, if you people who are worried about overregulation and High future taxes should be worried about overregulation and high future taxes rather than being worried about poor sales and um, interest rates. Um, the need to control inflation in order to avoid a double dip as people get scared of inflation requires that people actually be scared of inflation, which means that asset price, asset market signals of what expected inflation is should be showing that it's going up. Um, and for Lucas, Fama, and Scholes, you know, um, as you say, um, if you don't know um, why banks and financial assets are relatively special and that an excess demand for financial assets produces a deficient demand for goods and services, um, if you don't know something that the rest of the economics profession has had straight for 180 years, um, you know, why are you up there talking? Um, similarly, if you haven't thought that investors are a different group um, than taxpayers, and when you shift the burden of bearing risk off of overburdened investors onto taxpayers, you may well affect um, the risk premium. 
um, you kind of haven't even started thinking through the issues. Um, and this is what I blame you know, on Milton Friedman. Um, his libertarian idea that you want to establish property rights, establish courts, and otherwise get out of the way, that Friedman's recognition that that really wasn't sufficient, that the uneven depression history of the world since 1825 um, said you have to do something else, and Friedman said the right something else is keep the money stock growing smoothly. If you do that, you don't have to worry about either high inflation or mass unemployment. Um, and then the corollary, um, once you've signed up for my semi-libertarian agenda, you don't have to pay any attention to what these other economists have been doing. Um, that the consequence um, is an awful lot of economists coming out of the Friedman tradition um, who don't know anything about depression economics macro uh, because they never studied it. Um, and here Paul Krugman thinks I'm actually being a little too mean to Uncle Milton. That is, that the current um, people are two or three generations beyond Milton Friedman in terms of intellectual influence. And that although he started the ball rolling, it could have been deflected at lots of points before here. Um, and so we have a bunch of people um, who haven't thought issues through and yet are compelled because they're talkative, um, because they're libertarian and think government intervention has to always be wrong or because they're playing on Team Republican and Team Republican demands um, their obedience, uh, that they've got to opine on these questions and come up with some theory of why we're in a big recession, which isn't the monetarist theory, which doesn't work, and also isn't the Keynesian theory, which they know is wrong because Milton Friedman told them so. Um, and that, I think, is the intellectual process. Uh, that generates the people who say that banking and fiscal policy must be ineffective as stimulative measures, um, that generates um, the view that you can do it all through monetary policy alone, um, that generates um, the view of those who say we really have to control inflation, um, that generates those who say it's because of uncertainty, because of overaccumulation, because of structural unemployment, or because of the existence of low marginal product workers. Um, and that's where I want to conclude our depression economics section um, and say at least I hope that you all will hold firmly to um, the idea that we could get out of our current high unemployment dilemma, that we could push our unemployment rate down from 9% to 6% relatively quickly and relatively smoothly if only we had the political will to undertake the stimulative fiscal and monetary policies to do so. And that next time, um, next time we're going to start on situations in which you do need to control inflation. Um, the economy of the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, because situations in which an economy faces an inflation problem, well, we had them in the past, and they may well come back again in the future. And let me stop there. <laughs>